Amen. Good evening. Somebody give the Lord some praise. It's good to see you today. Amen. Everybody doing good? How's everybody's week been so far? You doing all right? Some of y'all look like you need some prayer and breakthrough already. It's just been three days since Sunday. Y'all lost the victory already? <laughs> good to see you. Everybody joining online. Welcome to you too. Welcome to Midweek. It's so good to see you today. We're glad that you were able to make it. It's been a beautiful day. And uh, we've just been rejoicing all day in the Lord's goodness. Amen. Anybody blessed besides me? I just, I'm just i just so blessed. The Lord's been so good to me. And uh, it's just been a great week so far. Amen. God's been good to us. Let's stand tonight. Let's go to the Lord in, in prayer and jump into praise and worship. I mean, I don't know about you, but I have uh, needs in my life and people I love and that are close to me. And I'm just grateful that God is able to move and meet on those needs and be able to uh, minister to us tonight. Amen. I don't know if you've had a rough week or not. Uh, maybe you are praying even for someone. I'm grateful that Jesus is able to move for us tonight. Amen. Let's just go to the Lord. Father, we just love you today. We give you praise to be in the presence of the great I Am. We're thankful to be in the presence of the God who has saved us by amazing grace. And I know we just lift up our hearts to you. We lift up our hands to you. And we just give you praise and we surrender everything that we have. Everything that we have to the name of Jesus. Father, we love you. And we're so grateful to be here. Bless every need begin to move in the heart of every person, God. God, those who are discouraged and still defeated, I pray that joy and victory will rise up within them tonight. Father, move in the house, move in this place as we lift up the praises, let the kind of glory of the Lord fall in this church tonight and at home to those who are watching online. We love you and we give you praise and ask it in the name of Jesus. Somebody say, Amen. Let's thank you for the Lord tonight. Thank you, God, is so good. God is good.
Lord is greatly to be praised. I'm so thankful for the name of Jesus and for His power. Here in the other name, a name is very significant. Names have meaning and everything. But there's only one name that we can call on that we can just say. There's only one name that can break addiction. There's only one name that can set you free. There's only one name that can liberate you from depression and the suicidal thoughts and demons that can torment and talk your mind. And that name is Jesus. The name of Jesus has power in the midnight hour. He's the power of the day. The Bible says that if Jesus has the authority in heaven and on the earth, then he lives in the heart. I mean, know you've got some authority in the name of Jesus. Amen. We've got authority in the name of Jesus. And that name has power. Amen. How many are grateful tonight that you have a name that you can call it? A name that is above every name. The Bible says that the name of Jesus, that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord. To the glory of God the Father. How many are grateful that we aren't going to be forced to do that one day, but we get to do that right here and now. We get to declare the name of Jesus. It's powerful and amazing and wonderful. Hallelujah. Amen. Grateful for that name. You can be seated tonight. Praise the Lord. Uh, we get a couple of you guys. We get uh, many of you folks right here to help me with giving tonight. Grab a plate and pull me if you would. Let's worship the Lord with our gifts and giving. And may God have been so good to us. And He's been so faithful. I'm thankful for the kingdom work. This isn't just church work. This isn't just, just for compassion. This is kingdom work. We're getting to merge in the kingdom of God and getting to see Him do some amazing things. And I'm thankful that we get to be a small part of that in the church. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We're grateful for our gifts. And we're grateful for those who have been faithful in giving. And we just pray tonight that everything that is given would be blessed. And uh, everything that we return back into the kingdom of God would be blessed in such an amazing way. So, Lord, tonight we're grateful that we have anything at all to give. We bless the name of Jesus. And, God, we pray that you bless every gift and giver. And we're thankful tonight for all these things that you've done for us. But we give back to you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. And somebody said Amen. God bless you for giving. Just want to turn your attention to the screen there. We're going to have to remind you of a few things uh, that are happening in the upcoming months. We'll try to get the volume there for you. Apologize. Mm-hmm. It's got just a little bit of echo there, but um, we'll just stay tuned here. Lots of exciting things coming up.
Yeah, lots of exciting things coming up Amen. for a brand new month. Don't forget, lots of uh, things including Mother's Day. Uh, and make sure you invite plenty of people out for that day. We're going to have a very special service and a gift for all of our ladies. Um, uh, also, this coming Sunday, do not forget, we're taking up our offering for our teachers' outreach. Uh, did this last year, and it was a huge success. It really blessed our community. We are going to be taking 92 dozen donuts out to all of our public schools again. We have, I believe, 12, I believe it is, uh, public schools in Hamlin County. And then also the Board of Education building, they're close to East High School. So we're going to be taking those again and distributing those on uh, next Thursday, May, I believe that is the, what is that, the 5th? On that morning, uh, if you want to help with that, you can come and do that with us. We're going to be uh, meeting here at the church this time uh, because I'm going to be getting donuts and uh, our event team and whoever else wants to help with this yet. It's next Thursday, May the 5th. So we are all going to be meeting here at the church. Uh, and we need to know, get a heads up so we can get a plan together. If you want to come and help with that and you're able to, then meet us here at about 8 o'clock and then we're going to um, get everybody dispersed to the schools and get those taken care of like we did last year. We're just going to take a little sign with them and tell them that compassion loves them, we care about them, and we are praying for them, and we're so thankful for all that they do for our kids. So help us be praying about that, and uh, we're taking up that donation Sunday morning, so help us uh, give towards that, and uh, we'll be so grateful, amen, that we get to do this. Uh, it's going to be such a blessing. Amen. So at this time, I'm going to go ahead and let our compassion kids and students and everybody that's not dismissed already can be dismissed. And we're going to jump into a word tonight, a little lesson, a little study. Um, I tend to do this out of the book of Nehemiah, where we're going to be about once a year. So this is going to be great. Hopefully it's going to be great and it's going to be helpful to you. So uh, you can be turning there if you want to with me. Nehemiah chapter 1. It's good to see everybody and everybody that's watching online. Welcome to our online church family again. I'm grateful to have you. Or if you go back and watch, I know that there are several of you who still uh, are watching online. So we love you and we're grateful to have you. Uh, before I jump in and start reading the scripture tonight, have you ever had a really big dream or a big vision maybe for your life? Something that you really wanted to do or maybe even something that you aspired to do or had on your heart and you uh, you just had big dreams and big visions. Um, maybe there are things that you wanted to do with a business or an opportunity that came up for you or something that you just planned that you uh, thought would be great. Maybe it's even something to do with your retirement. I don't know what that looks like for you, but whatever you uh, wanted to do, you just had a big dream or a big goal or something that you've been working towards. Um, how many know that God loves big dreams and big visions, but he's, he's a God, I found out, who requires us to work small, if you will, to be able to get there. And I love that because the Bible tells us that when we understand that when we when we are able to be good stewards over little things or work work over small things and take care of the smaller things, that we uh, are then entrusted with things that are much larger and much bigger and much more of a blessing. So we work small, but we have a huge outcome and big dream. Tonight in our text, talking about that, I think we will find a very powerful visionary by the name of Nehemiah. I want to read Nehemiah chapter 1 here. There's quite a few, 11 verses here, and we're going to find out why exactly this visionary paved a road for you and I 
all of these years later and why this is so significant. So let's start reading in verse 1. If you don't have your Bible, you'll have it on the screen there. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakili, uh came to pass in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan, the citadel. Verse 2 said that Hanani, one of, the bre- one of my brethren, came, he writes, with men from Judah. And I asked, I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the captivity concerning Jerusalem. I'm going to explain what he's talking about in just a second. Verse 3, and then he said to me, they said to me, the survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down, and its gates are burned with fire. So it was when I heard these words that I sat down and wept, Nehemiah says, and mourned for many days, and I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, I pray, Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant and mercy with those who you love or who love you and observe your commandments, please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night, for the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which have, we have sinned against you, both my father's house and I have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, nor the ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. Remember, I pray, the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though some of you were cast out to the farthest part of the heavens, Yet I will gather them from there and bring them to the place which I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. Now, these are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O Lord, I pray, please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name. And let your servant prosper this day, I pray, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. For I was the king's cupbearer. Amen. This is wonderful. I love the words of Nehemiah. His, you can tell how sincere he is and his plea and his cry and what he is talking about. So we're going to break down and talk about this for just a second. What is happening here is the people of, of Judah and the city of Jerusalem are now in a very terrible condition. Um, over 150 years prior to what we are reading and what Nehemiah is pleading with God, uh, Nebuchadnezzar the king and the armies of Babylon have invaded Israel, and they have carried many people away as slaves. This is known as the Babylonian uh, Empire, the captivity of God's people into Babylon. The Jews were in desperate need of someone who could rise up with a vision to restore the people of God and the plans that God had for His people. I want to take a moment and just say that God has great plans for His people, but as we just talked about Sunday, God will also never override our free will. And so when the people of God began to sin and turn away from the Lord and the nations were away from God, uh, the Lord was not going to force them to do the good things that He planned, and so He let them choose the road that they took, the path that they took. And now they're in desperate need for someone to restore Jerusalem to its former glory and and to uh, see a move of God happen. They needed somebody, though, who was going to be very different. They needed someone who would be a visionary of great anointing and authority. Someone who would be on fire for God. Somebody who would come in and not just be any other joker, but somebody who would really come in with a vision to restore what they had lost and to see the power of God move. Big dreams and somebody with a big vision for the future. And I believe that God had such a man, and his name was Nehemiah. Nehemiah was being prepared by God, and he was, he was a willing vessel that was going to be used greatly by the hands of the Lord to rebuild the city of Jerusalem and to bring about the restoration of the nation of Israel. And he had a vision and a plan to do that. You can tell how sincere he was in what we just read. And you and I may be thousands of years removed from the time of Nehemiah, but we also live in a nation who desperately need people of vision. We live in a nation today in the United States of America in 2022 where many people have waxed cold and indifferent against the Lord. People have left their morals. They have no moral compass or no, um, no in, a, in a better way to say that perhaps is, is they just don't have uh, 
it, it's kind of like the Bible says, in the end times, there were, it's going to seem that everything that was once good will be thought of as evil. Everything that was once evil will be thought of as good. People have everything so backwards and messed up that it's going to be, it, it, we are living in those days. We are living in the times where nations are rising against nations. There are wars and rumors of wars. There are people who have turned to wickedness and turned to sin and evil. And then there are some people who just blatantly mock those things that are of God. It disturbs me greatly that, that dear people who, um, who are trapped by demons of homosexuality even use God's rainbow as a flag for their pride and their sin. And it's very disturbing to see how the nation has become so cold and indifferent from God. And it is very heartbreaking. We need a revival. We need a move of God. And we need visionaries like Nehemiah that can rise up with that kind of vision. We live in that day to where the, the morality and virtue has been, in society, has essentially been torn down. It has essentially been broken like what we just read. Walls of separation between the church and the world are no more. You can't hardly figure out where the world ends and the church begins anymore. Come on, somebody. It's very difficult to find out what, uh, how churches look in one aspect and the world looks in another. How many know that today there should still be a difference in the church and out in the world? Somebody say amen. There should be a difference. There should be a noticeable difference from the people of God to people who are lost and don't serve God. And the gates of glory that identified church as the house of God, uh, what we know as, like, for example, Compassion Church being the house of God, has been burned down by the flames of sin and has been tarnished by the infection of a lack of feeling or emotion to, um, to what is going on in the spirit realm. We don't, we don't have vision and we need people with vision. God is seeking men and women in all areas of the world, including Morristown, Tennessee, and beyond, to have vision and to do the kingdom work that God has called all of us to do. Amen? It is no secret that people of vision encounter problems. So as we begin to look through the search for visionaries, God is looking for people who can have vision and who can absolutely carry out the will of the kingdom. In verse 1, I think that you can kind of start out by looking, if you dissect this and break it down, you can really see the calmness in Nehemiah's life. It doesn't look like things are that bad, and it just kind of starts out very subtle. And, um, and you just see that he lived a life as the king's cupbearer. He was living a life of peace. Nehemiah was living a life of even prosperity and even had political power and somewhat of authority in that, uh, in that time because he was, he was to ensure the king of his safety and to make sure that his meals were safe because back then a lot of times it would be common for people uh, who were an enemy of a king to poison their food and try to kill them. And so he had a very big responsibility to make sure that the king was safe. He would have been one of the most trusted men in the entire kingdom for this kind of responsibility. And uh, the king, I'm sure, having this much influence, the king, I'm sure, would talk to Nehemiah and from time to time would probably ask him advice and would talk to him about certain things. He was, he was a man that had a life of great serenity and great ease in his life. Uh, Nehemiah was, was uh, what you could probably say, living the good life. He was living it up. He had a great thing going for him. But in verses 2 and 3, we kind of see a shift begin to take place from that into the calamity of Nehemiah's life. Now, the peace and serenity that he had was really shattered by his brother. Leave it to a sibling to try to come in and ruin everything for you. Come on. <laughs> Leave it to a brother to come in and try to kick you and, and knock you while you're down. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but <laughs> that's what happened. He brings news that people, the people of Israel are now being affected by their enemies, and the city of Jerusalem has been completely and utterly devastated. I find it amazing how perfect things can be one moment in your life, and then the very next moment it seems like things can just be shattered and torn apart. Has it ever seemed like that for you in your life? seems like that sometimes we can have an amazing service on Sunday, and then all hell can break loose on Monday, and things that you didn't expect or plan for or, or certainly never imagined will all of a sudden come to pass and begin to take place. Um, just talking before church with someone, and uh, you had two different members in their family that had car trouble this week. And uh, it seems like when it rains, it pours. And if you're anything like me, after it pours, there's lightning and thunder and tornadoes and everything else. Come on. <laughs> it just seems like that things can happen in just a split second. And it's amazing how that seems to happen. But verse 4 of what we're reading starts to reveal, after this calamity and the bad news, the compassion in Nehemiah's life. You start to see his heart 
become so vulnerable and so upright before the Lord and him almost begging and pleading God to remember his promises. When Nehemiah hears this terrible news, his heart breaks. And then the Bible says that he immediately does what? It does not say that he gets mad at God. It does not say that he questions the Lord and says, why did you allow this to happen? Why could you? How could you? This is ridiculous. Instead, the Bible says that Nehemiah did exactly what he knew to do, and that was to enter a time of fasting. He began to fast and push back things that that he wanted to sacrifice, and he began to pray and seek the Lord and uh, was just weeping before God. Instead of being happy in his position, his life is now shattered and he's been brought down to his knees. I want to take a moment right here to say this is how God forms people with vision. This is how God creates a, a, a heart in someone who has a great big vision and a great big dream. He knows how to stir up our nest, if you will, whenever we become complacent and we live the good life and things are going well. I'm not saying that God comes in and ruins your life when things are going well. We certainly know that's not the truth. But God knows how to get our hearts and our mindsets on things that truly matter. I don't know about you, but if we're all being very honest, there are some times in our lives to where we get so comfortable in things that seem so good that we forget about sacrifices and we forget about testing our faith as we talked about Sunday and pursuing a relationship deeper with God in things that are beyond my world. Things that are just beyond me that are not just to do with me. And God will come in and I found out that He interrupts your life sometimes with, um, with something that will cause you to reflect and get back to your first love and refocus yourself and get vision back. And it motivates you to want to do better. And it changes all of your motives to want to be the, the motives of God's heart. It makes for a very discom- uh, time of discomfort and complacency, but His reward, amen, His reward will never lie. Even though you go through those uncomfortable moments, they are extremely eternal when God blesses you. The blessings that Yahweh brings with discomfort are far greater than anything else in life. Somebody shout a big Wednesday night, amen. So for Nehemiah, the innocent question right here is asked in verse 2. And it would be a pivotal moment in his life. The very fact that he cared so much about the nation of Israel, about the people of God, to even ask this question, there is evidence that God is already working in his heart to rise up and be a man of vision that will do something about the nation that he loves, that needs desperately a move of God. So when he, when he hears this response, it brings him to his knees before God. He begins to hit his knees in prayer. See, God wanted to restore Jerusalem. I believe that. But he needed a man of vision to bring that to pass. How many know that God can do anything in just the, in the blink of an eye? God can snap his fingers and make something happen. But many times he chooses a method to get there. Come on, somebody. He chooses a method for uh, what he's going to carry out. He chooses a person many times. He needs somebody to go for him. And the news of Jerusalem was God's call for Nehemiah to become involved in what God wanted to do here um, was a big deal. When God stirs up your nest, that's his call for you to become involved in what he is about to do and the plans of God for what he wants to do. And now when that call comes, I think people respond in, in several different ways. Some people may be like the prophet Isaiah, if you remember him. He responded extremely eagerly to the invitation of God. In Isaiah 6 and 8, the Bible says, Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Who shall I send, and who will go for us? And then I said, Here am I, send me. That is an eager response to God, saying immediately, Let's go, let's do it. Others like Jonah try to run from the call of God on their lives. Jonah in chapter 1 and verse 1 through 3, he says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise and go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose, not to answer the call of God, but to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down from, to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Still, there are others, I think, in the Bible who are kind of like Moses, who see the vision and they try to take matters in their own hands and do things their own way in their own time, and I've been guilty of that myself. But when that, when that fails and they're all brought to a place to where they have to wait on God, the job will get done the right way. Sometimes when we try to rush the things of God, we do it the wrong way, and God never intended for us to do that. 
That's why patience is very important. But either way, just remember, God knows how to get your attention. One of the most sobering things that I ever heard in my life was from my mother when I was a teenager. When I was a teenager, I was, I was starting down a path, being a young man, trying to figure things out, and I started getting a very, um, a very big head about things that I was too confident in. And I started becoming uh, almost pig-headed in certain areas, and I started bucking up against a lot of things, and I started you know, going against a lot of things that I knew I shouldn't have, and I was trying to do things on my own, with my own terms, on my own time, and, and trying to take matters in my own hands and plan my own future, and I was, in many, in many ways, leaving God out of that. My mom looked at me one day, and she said, you need to be very careful because God will humble you one way or the other. And I've never forgot those words some 18 years later. I've never forgotten those words because they penetrated my soul. I was terrified that if I kept up on that route, that God would choose the other. And I didn't want that to happen. God knows how to get our attention, and whenever He stirs up your nest, He will place a burden on your heart. And when He does that, please don't hesitate to respond to Him. Go with Him whatever He calls you to do. He has great plans. And how many know there is nothing greater than being part of the blessing? How many, I should say it this way, being allowed to be a part of the blessing of God. Because He doesn't need me. But He chooses to use people like me and you because He wants to be a blessing in your life. Amen? So our text then shows that people with vision will exercise prayer. I, do we still believe in prayer and compassion? Okay, I thought we did. I'm just making sure. So as Nehemiah goes before the Lord in prayer, the Bible says that he sort of sets the example for other people who want to have great vision too. He teaches us today how to come before the Lord in prayer. A visionary in verse 5, I think what he is saying here, that prayer involves praise. I don't know about you, but I can't hardly pray to God without including a lot of praise. In fact, the Bible says that we should enter into His court with thanksgiving. Amen? And so Nehemiah begins praying uh, and exalting the Lord. He praises God for His superiority. He praises God for His strength, for His sovereignty, and for His sacredness. And he also praises God for His sincerity because God has a very real and sincere heart. He praises God simply just for who He is. That is a lesson that all of us need to learn today. Sometimes we don't need to praise God just because He can do a thing. Sometimes we just need to praise God just because He's God. Just because He is great and holy and worthy to be praised. And God does not have to perform or show out or do anything like that. He's just God and He's just worthy for me to praise Him. It's that simple. After all, remember, this is exactly how Jesus taught His disciples to pray over in Matthew chapter 6. When he says, in this manner, therefore, pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Amen. This is exactly what Jesus was saying, that the name of the Lord is holy. Uh, I alluded to it a moment ago, but we'll go ahead and read it. Psalm 104. He says, enter into his gate with thanksgiving. He says, start out by giving thanks to God. Enter into his courts with praise and be thankful to him and bless his name. This tells me that whenever I go to God, there should be a song of praise on my lips. There should be a, a praise that comes out of my mouth, and, and surely my tongue ought to be working overtime to give the Lord praise for all that He's done. And He shows us as a visionary that prayer involves that kind of praise. I think something else that He also adds to this is that it also has to include some perseverance, some pressing, and some pushing through sometimes. Sometimes... If we're all being very honest, you've got to push, and sometimes it's not so easy. Sometimes it's not easy uh, to get up early and get to church or, or whatever. Sometimes it's not easy to get up and pray or read the Bible or do a devotional or, um, you know, do something that takes some discipline to do. There is some perseverance and pressing through getting through your trial, getting through your situation, getting through your tragedy. You've got to press sometimes. And so Nehemiah says that he prayed, what did he say? He prays day and night. Before the Lord, he prayed until the answer came. He didn't just pray once. He prayed until God gave him an answer. That is the kind of praying that I think churches need to demonstrate today. Instead of just saying that, because one thing that drives me crazy is people oftentimes will say, pray for me, or pray for this one that's my loved one who is sick, or pray for this situation, or pray for that. And people are almost shocked whenever God actually moves and answers their prayer request. It drives me crazy. We should almost be much more surprised when it doesn't happen. We should expect it to happen. 
That's what faith does. It's not the kind of prayer that just stops after a time or even two, but it's the kind of prayer that ought to go forth to God and then stays before the Lord until it has seen what it came after. Come on. There's not one time, amen, that I should come up there and just say, one time, Jesus, deliver me. One time, Jesus, save my spouse or save my kids or, or bring healing for me or whatever. But it should be over and over and over again. My prayers should be ringing the bells of heaven, as we say. It should be echoing through uh, the throne room of grace over and over. That's what Jesus called us to do. A prayer that is born out of a genuine burden cannot be satisfied until it has received an answer. Amen? Until we get an answer, we continue to seek the Lord. Even if it's not the answer we wanted, we continue to seek God for His answer anyway. Sometimes we give up, I think, way too soon or way too easily. You don't have to admit that, but I think I will for myself. Sometimes I do. If it's not God, then we move on. And we say, okay, God, we submit to your will. I was praying, in fact, all this week and have been praying for a situation and uh, for someone who is very near to me and been, been praying and fasting, seeking the Lord and just trying to uh, call upon his name. And as we, as myself and others were praying and fasting and seeking the Lord, it was, it was amazing to me that I was talking to somebody about it who was praying along with me and I was just kind of telling them, you know, I, be- I believe with all of my heart that God can do exactly what we are praying for. I believe it. In fact, I felt it so strong. I felt when I was sending a text message with that in there, I felt the Holy Spirit all over me. And I, I was fighting back tears, even just trying to send the message because I believe that much in God to do something. But later on, this afternoon, we got the answer that we did not want. But it doesn't doesn't change the fact that I came in here ready to worship God. His name is holy. He's sovereign. He is just in all of his ways. And I worship him with everything in me. And I will still trust in his way for my life. And then I move on. That I don't stop praying and believing in him until I hear his will. Until I get his answer. And then I will be satisfied, even if I don't like it. Amen? I found out that God may not always say yes and no. I found out, too, that God sometimes will say, not yet. God will sometimes say, wait just a little bit longer. And God may say, I want to see what you do while you're waiting. Because it's easy when God just says, bam, here you go, there's the answer. It's so much harder to tarry and wait and just try to see what's going to come of it when you don't know what will you do. How do you respond to that kind of test? How will we, will we worship God and praise Him and just give Him glory? Or we get so frustrated and aggravated that we start drifting away? For those of us who carry and wait, keep on asking and keep on seeking and keep on knocking and worship anyway. All of those things, I believe that we will still see the blessing and the glory of God. Amen. And it's very important that we do that whenever we talk about this kind of, uh, this kind of discipline in prayer. Amen. So then the next part, if we're breaking all this down and unpacking a very large suitcase of what he just said, um, I believe that the next thing that we should say is uh, together. Let's say together in unison. Everybody say repentance. Repentance. This is a huge word loaded with great meaning and significance from heaven. A visionary prayer will involve repentance every single time. As a man prays, as a woman prays and begins to seek God and then confess our sins and flaws and our wrongs in our life, and God knows we all have them, as an individual, uh, not only for our individual sins, but even the sins of an entire nation. There are some things that I repent of as a whole for our nation that I have not personally been involved in. But I do that because I know that there are sins in our nation. I love this country. I love the United States of America. And I still believe in us. And I will still pray and seek God for revival, even in the midst of, of somewhat of chaos and things that are very uncertain. And a 40-year record of inflation and all sorts of other things that are going on. I still seek God for His glory and for His power and for revival in this nation. And, um, and what Nehemiah was doing here was confessing sins that he didn't even commit. These, the Bible, we just read in Scripture, were the sins of his fathers, the Bible says. He was a man, though, that came before God who was praying and fasting, and he had a heart of repentance. Family, this is essential if we are ever going to see prayers answered. God wants to see a heart of repentance. Amen? A heart that is repentant towards him. Not just to see where everybody else is going wrong, but also he wants us to he he wants us to see where we are uh, where we are physically and spiritually, and then where God Himself is going to uh, where God Himself is going to take us. Because if we don't get real with God and sometimes acknowledge, hey, that was my fault. 
That situation, I just went in, that was nobody's fault but my own. Come on. That was nobody's fault but me because I made a bad choice. We blame everything on the devil. We give him so much credit sometimes, and sometimes it was just me making a stupid decision. Come on. Sometimes it was just me making a bad choice and, and falling into a sin trap that I should not have done. And this is where we have to admit, sometimes I just missed the boat with God. I missed it. I did the wrong thing. Repentance is about me getting my heart right with God. Somebody say this. Repentance doesn't just get me a quick pass so I just say, hey, God, it's me. I repent. Listen, I need you to start moving for all of my needs now. <laughs> Repentance is something so much different because it shows me my sin and my wrongdoing in my own heart, and then it allows me to be forgiven because of the precious redemption in the blood of Jesus. And then it prepares my heart to be stronger the next time that that thing approaches me so that I'm better than I was before. Remember, repentance is not just saying I'm sorry. Repentance literally comes from the Greek word metanoia, which means to have a change of heart or to change your mind. It means to change things and to be different. So that's what he does. His prayer involves repentance. As you go back down and to start to finish this up, in verses 8 through 10, his prayer that he is begging God for in the nation of Israel also involves promises. How many are so thankful that God has promises for you? I am so grateful for the promises of God. Now, Nehemiah begins to remind God of his promises that he makes to Israel. He reminds God, and I love that because it's not that God, God forgets. How many know sometimes you've got to remind yourself and you've got to call them out in prayer to let God know that you still trust Him even though you haven't seen it yet? I still trust God on promises that I believe that I have not seen that I've been believing for for many years. And I still call them out not because God has forgotten them but because I need to remind myself that those promises are still there. So it was promises that God not only said that He would punish them for their sins because of what they've done wrong, but He also said that He would restore them in the event of their repentance. Aha! Now it ties back in. Now we're coming back full circle. As Nehemiah begins to pray and seek God, he reminds him that it is it's not his, it is not just the effort of himself, it's not just his work, because he might be destined to be the star of the show. Nehemiah might be destined to lead the whole nation. He might be destined to be the greatest visionary that there ever was. But in the same sense, it is a, it is a, uh, this prayer and this fasting of seeking God is a thing that was going to have to include all of them. This was going to be a team effort, if you will. It has to be the whole body of, of the Lord. So let me encourage you, get as many people as you can to be praying with you. Get as many people as you can being in your, in your side, in your court, on, uh, you know, people in your tribe who will be just like you, like-minded and pray with you and stick to the, the face of God with you. The Lord told us that there was power in corporate prayer when people get together and pray. And then one can send a, a thousand to flock, two can send ten thousand to flock. The math doesn't even make sense, but it's Holy Ghost math. I mean, it's amazing how uh, the, the power of, uh, of being together and joining together is uh, multiplies the move of God. I mean, any, any uh, area or any specific situation where there are two or three, in my name, he says, gathering there in the midst, he says, I will be there. That's why it's so important that we stay in church. That's why it's so important that we are in the family of God, that we pray for one another, that we lift each other up, that we love people, and that we are that we are holding one another up. How many remember the story of Moses whenever he was going into battle? I believe it was with the Amalekites. And while he goes into battle, he goes up on top of a, of a hillside, on a mountainside, and he goes up there with two people, one his brother Aaron, who was a priest, and the other her, H-U-R, amen? And this was, this was amazing because I think this is a great representation in this time of battle that there was a prophet who was Moses, there was a priest who was Aaron, and there was somebody from, named Her there. We don't know much about him, but we know that he was from the line of Judah, which was a, 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 um, a, a king line. This was the king, kingly tribe we talked about a while back, the, the line of the tribe of Judah. This was the same uh, lineage where Jesus the Messiah would come from. So now you have a prophet, a priest, and a king, if you will, standing up on the hillside. And the Bible says that as long as Aaron and Hur were helping Moses lift up his tired arms, they would prevail in battle against the Amalekites, and God would give them victory. 
that as soon as he would put his arms down, that they would begin to lose. Now, there was nothing magical in his arms, but it was, I think it was the sheer uh, fact that there was the prophet, a priest, and a king. The power of God fell upon them, and his approval was there. What do you, what do you say about all this? What do you get about all this information? Sometimes you need somebody there with you to hold your arms up whenever you can. Sometimes you need someone to be there and hold you up and encourage you and speak life over you. Finally, I think there is mention of the providence or destiny here. The final statement of Nehemiah is in verse 11. It seems to indicate that he felt the weight of the assignment that was heavy. He knew who he was and where he was at this moment. It was by no accident. So his position is not in any kind of an accident here. Can I tell you that regardless of any position that you are in in your life, whether it's a position that's at church or at work or school or home or whatever, you need to know that it is not by accident because I don't believe God works that way. God has placed you where you are in, in seasons that you're in and places that you're in for a purpose, and it is for His purpose. Amen. There are no accidents or coincidences with God. You are where you are for His glory. Prosperity is no accident. And I'm not even talking about prosperity as just in cash money. Come on, I'm not just saying that if you sow a seed of $500, that you'll be a millionaire. I'm not talking about that kind of prosperity. I'm talking about the resources that you have been given, that God has blessed you with, not only money, but other things too, are not just given to you by love. It doesn't work that way. They have been given to you by the providence of God and to be used for His glory. Find out what God would have you do with those things. And then the wise men that came at the birth of Jesus were, were wealthy and prospered and all these things, and they knew what to do with their blessings, and they poured them out upon Jesus. Finally, I would say to you, as we are about to close, that power is no accident. The influence that you have been given in your life and influence sometimes that you have in the lives of other people is not an accident. Listen, family, there are, there are people sometimes that you can reach that I can't reach. That, I don't know, whoever else you can name can't reach. Any other pastor, evangelist, teacher, whoever. There are people out there that God has given you influence in their life that can reach. I'll share this cute little story with you. There was someone who came here Sunday morning on Easter a couple of weeks ago, and they had been hurt in church and had not been in church in years. And they said they wouldn't go back to church. And there was a seven-year-old little boy who knew this man really, really well. And he called him up and he said, why don't you come to church with me on Easter Sunday morning? I want to see you there. And he said, yes. And he was here on Easter Sunday morning and got to hear the gospel ministered and preached to him because a seven-year-old boy had influence in his life. He was able to reach him. You never know who you can reach that somebody else can't. You think if I had called and invited that man and he didn't even know me, do you think he would have really come? Of course not. But a seven-year-old boy had influence, and he was able to come and hear the gospel. And then God has you where you are for a purpose. God has given the ear of someone else to you for a purpose so that you can speak into that. Allow him to use you where you are for his glory. I'm going to close with this quote uh, from Vance Havner. He was an evangelist in North Carolina in the early 1900s, and he said this. He said, I thank, I thank God for the unseen hand. He says, sometimes urging me onward, sometimes it's holding me back, and sometimes it is with a caress of approval. Sometimes it's with a stroke of reproof, and sometimes it is correcting, but sometimes it is also comforting, and my times are all in his hands. I think this is very important for us to remember as we serve God. Would you agree with me that we desperately need people with vision in this day today? Vision is something that is so hard to attain right now because the devil is fighting the church. Do the nail, trying so hard to stop vision because he doesn't want the kingdom of God advancing in the earth. People are desperate for vision right now. People are, are starving to death for something, for vision, for real, for authenticity. And I think that's why we need visionaries today. I think we all need people who will be in touch with God for people on the, on the behalf of other people and who will be moved by God from the heart of God to see people uh, into the kingdom of God. We need that kind of people in our families, in our churches, and in our nations, our communities, certainly. And I think those are the kind of people who God will use to change the entire world. You say, well, I'm in Morristown. It doesn't matter. You can still change the world around you wherever you are. Amen. The question that we face tonight is, do you really want to be one of these people? The search for visionaries is on. God is looking actively. But do you want to be one? If you do, you need to realize that God has you living in this day and age, this time, wherever you are, for a purpose. This is your season. This is your moment. And God may have given you influence or something that you can do that will change somebody else. 
You need to get before Him and find whatever purpose that God is trying to use you in, in this season of your life. You catch His vision for that because you can affect someone and see that purpose fulfilled. I believe that God will use you, amen, if you allow Him to use you. If you will be available, God will respond. Father, we love you today. We give you praise. We're grateful for vision. We are so thankful that you are still speaking to the hearts of men and women today. You are still calling people out of darkness, and it's a marvelous light. You are still calling people to give vision where there are so many who are desperate for it. They have been blind, and they are not able to see. God, today, I pray that you would make all of us tonight people of great vision and have anointing and grace and favor to be able to reach those who seem unreachable. God, we, we just ask tonight for the favor and grace of the Lord Jesus Christ to be on every single one of these people here or watching online. Lord, just let the favor of God be upon us as we try to help people. Apostle Paul said that by all means, everything that we do, we are just trying to at least reach some. God, we may not be able to reach everybody, but let us reach some. Let there be some people who we can affect and who we can see uh, blessed by the kingdom of God and have the anointing of the Lord on their lives. Jesus, help us to reach the one that you are looking for us to reach and be a blessing to someone else. God, we love you. We're grateful tonight for your spirit. We're thankful for the way that you're moving in our church, in our families, and in our future. And we give you praise for it. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Somebody say, amen. Bless your family. I love you all. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your week. Don't forget Sunday morning teachers offering. We're going to be a blessing to our community next Thursday morning on the 5th at uh, 8 o'clock. We're going to be meeting here around 8 a.m. and trying to head out shortly after we get our plan together and get everybody set up. So be praying about that. I love you all. Invite somebody to be here Sunday morning. Let's have a great day in the Lord. And uh, until then, I will see you Sunday morning. Bless you online family. Love you all too. And I hope you have a good rest of your week. God bless you.